Hello and welcome to Perthshire Online TV. I'm Gavin Simon. Welcome to our second show. So, Lindsay, tell me, have the Perthshire public been shy coming forward with their news? Not at all, Gavin. We've been really busy this week. We've been out and about uh, on site. We've been um, interviewing people. We've got plenty of content and news for you coming up. Um, but we're still really keen to hear from you. We've got plenty of shows to go out over the next few months. So, if you've got anything of interest, you've got interesting news, events, or so on, or anything. Um, secret that you'd like to tell us, you can contact us via our website, you can contact us via email, we've got a Twitter account and also a Facebook page and you can see all the details for that online or via our website, pressureonline.tv. So Gavin, what's coming up in the show today? Right, what's on the show today? Well, it's a, it's a busy, busy show. We've got a regular feature, um, What's On in Perthshire, and that's our roving reporter, Alan Gear, who's out and about finding out what's in the Perthshire Diary. We've also got the first of our new feature, a regular feature mm -hmm. with the Hub newspaper, and that's called the Community Hub. So it's actually discussing some of the local community stories um, in Perthshire. We've also got Don Gillies, fitness instructor, and you know, we're really, we're really lucky in Perthshire, Lindsay, because we've got some great venues and events. We have, yes. Some great yes, venues and events. Much. And we're really lucky on this show that we've got interviews with some of the management teams of those award-winning events, which is which is great. Super, 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 super venues, super shows, and it's nice to see Perthshire um, getting some awards for the effort that, that's put into those um, those events. And let's not forget, uh, this week it's Guy Fawkes Week. Um, lots of fireworks going to be going off everywhere. So um, in order to help everybody out, um, we've invited uh, some representatives from the Tayside Community Fire Team into the studio. And it's on with the show. Sit back and enjoy Perthshire Online. We're delighted to have one of our local MPs with us today, Mr Pete Wishart. Pete, welcome to Perthshire TV. Hey Gavin, thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Great. Um, Pete, one of our local key initiatives at this point in time is obviously around the, the city status and we're preparing ourselves for 2012. Um, wh where are we at this point in time with the whole status? Now, we got, I mean, we're the only Scottish China. We've got um, Westminster backing at this point as well. How, how's it all holding together? Well, we haven't quite got Westminster backing given that there's something like 30 odd towns throughout the whole of the UK who are, are bidding for this um, coveted prize of city status. But I think what I can report is that, you know, I mean, the Perth bid is, is a good bid. It's a bid that's a supported by all the political parties in Scotland. It's got great community support. It is the sole Scottish bid, so I think what we're beginning to recognise is that you know everybody's coming around in Scotland to support our bid. Um, <clears throat> at first there was only going to be one um, successful mm. candidate throughout the United Kingdom. I think we've now got a concession from the Westminster government that there may be two and even three. Now, two obviously increases our chances, but if we get three, I think that significantly increases our chances because I think there would, would be pressure upon the Minister that's deciding this to make sure that a, a successful candidate would come from the nations or regions of the United Kingdom. So well, I think just now we're in a pretty good place. Fantastic. We, I mean, we had a recent um, TV programme that was that was featuring Perth very, very, very highly, mm -hmm. <laughs> particularly, and um, there was a bit of mixed reaction to that because there was um, there was a feeling from some parties mm -hmm. that it was great. Other people felt it didn't really show Perth off in its most vibrant state, and it kind of left us hanging at the end, asking a question of: Do we really mm -hmm. want to be a city, or would we prefer to be a town because we're going to leave a township behind to some extent? What's your thoughts around it all? Well, I th first of all, I, th I thought it was a, a good programme and I thought it was great that Perth got all this fantastic airtime and I think when people do come to Perth and have a look around and see what we've got to offer and the type of community that we are, there's always going to be a bit of a mixed bag. I mean I want to take the positives out of it, I think that you know it showed Perth mm -hmm. in a particularly good light. Yes, it was a critical look at some of the things that we're doing and you know I mean I would like to have had better conclusions to some of the, the things that we've been looking at. Well, really, you know, and but you know I, I think that it was it was good to get this airtime. There was there, there was certain questions that you know that were raised and some of the conclusions were perhaps not the ones that we would like to have seen. But I think that you know I mean as we go forward with our, our city status bid, that was a it was a good programme to have and it start it start also started a little bit of a debate in the city itself, which 
is no bad thing. Mm -hmm. And the the city hall, the, the, <laughs> the subject of the city hall, which is quite ripe at this point yeah. in time as well. well what's your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I've, I've been a Perthshire MP for 10 years, and I think throughout those 10 years, this has been one of the biggest, hottest, most significant issues mm. that we've all had to deal with. My, my feeling is that I just want it resolved. I just want that prime space within our city centre come back into use. I supported the Wharfside development, you know, I was in the retention city hall when that was a viable option and I really hoped that that would be delivered. Unfortunately it didn't, so we were back to square one. And I think the most realistic, the most, you know, the clearest way forward just now is the vision of the city square that the council have put forward and I think that's worthy of our support. But I'm still open if any viable suggestion or proposal comes forward for the retention of the hall, that we bring the hall back into use. I, I'm quite happy to look at that. Unfortunately, I don't think that's going to happen. I think that you know, if that was going to be a, a serious option, there would have been a, we would have seen plans, we would have seen who the backers were, and find a, a, a real because, vision. Because, because it's, it's nice, it's nice to have the creative ideas, but Absolutely. it's got to be something commercially viable at the same time. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, the, as, as soon as one course of action is being determined, there's obviously a whole lot of people coming and think, well I'm not happy with that and they've got their own plans for this thing and it's, it's quite right that they do, you know, people in Perth feel very passionate about their mm -hmm. city and particularly a thing, uh, a building like the City Hall, that is one of these places that, that do engender all this debate so, you know, I mean, but at some point we're going to have to make a decision and get on with it and uh, you know, I, I'm quite happy to support what the Council Have we got any it. understanding of what the timeline is around that? Well, my, my understanding is that the Council will come back to consider this in the not too distant future and once it's agreed and approved, I mean, work pretty much starts straight away and we get this thing happening and, you know, I mean, I, I think we'll, it'll take a few years obviously to get it all in place, but, you know, I mean, we, we really do need to enough, get enough on Enough talk this. and more action on Absolutely, it really now. Absolutely, that's what we need. So, so la last topic to discuss today, Pete, um, we've got changes to the boundaries um, for, mm -hmm. the, for the constituencies and I think that even, from what I understood, it even potentially impacts something like Schoon, where it's going to move out of a Persia constituency and into a Dundee mm -hmm. constituency <laughs> or something, so it's rumoured. Um, but what's your thoughts around this? And I mean, is it realistically something that the Perthshire public or inhabitants have got to have a have got to take account of, or, or is this just challenges for for some of the MPs themselves with well, regards to the moves? Well, what we've got to achieve in Scotland, we've currently got 57 members of Parliament in Westminster. This is to be reduced to 50. So, you know, we're taking seven mm. MPs out. What's a small group? And so, this is going to have an impact throughout the whole of Scotland in the way the constituencies have been carved up. But they've made an absolute pig's ear of what they've done for Perthshire. I mean, what they've done in, for my constituency it would be that I, I now inherit the southern part of Perth and Kinross, picking up Kinrossshire, Bridge of Erne, where we're, where we're mm -hmm. just outside Perth just now. And then what I lose is all of East Perth communities that I've represented for 10 years, like Cooper Angus and Ayleth, mm -hmm. and, and almost incredibly scooting, which is, you know, I mean, it's as close to Perth as you could possibly get, and you know, I mean, it sees itself very much part of the community of Perth, and inexplicably that gets put into this new Dundee West and Gowrie seat. So, like now, probably the MP's constituency office will be in Dundee, you know, and if you live in Schoon, I don't think. And think Schoon people are going to say they're part of a Dundee yeah, constituency, exactly. not Perth. That but seems crazy. It, at this stage, it's, it's out for consultation, and you know, like people will have the opportunity to give their view and opinion about this. And I would encourage people, if they're unhappy with this proposal, to get out and let the um, the, the Boundary Commission know that they're, 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 un they're unhappy about it. I mean, to me, parliamentary constituencies should be about communities and about how communities can be best be served. And, you know, I mean, Perth and North Persia works perfectly well for me, you know, I've got all of Highland Persia, East Persia, and the city of Perth. The new constituency is, is, is fine by me too, but, like, I don't think it serves particularly well the people of Schoon, Eilith, uh, Cooper Angus, and the Carse Gowrie, who will be part of a Dundee constituency. Mm -hmm. Pete, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. I hope you can pop back down and, jo <laughs> yes. and join us again soon and give us, give us an update, update in a month or so. Great. Thank you for that, Gavin. So, great, great hot topics today and um, let us know via Facebook and Twitter what you think. Hi, I'm Derek from Dixons of Perth. Are you looking for a used car? Why not pop in and see us? Here's a selection of over 90 cars that we have available.
to the show, the health and fitness show. Yes, and they've chosen me to be the health and fitness presenter. Why? Because I'm strong and butch? No, because I'm out of condition and fat. But don't worry, I've got some advice and I'm going to start getting fit. Now I've got Dawn Gillis here from uh, Delta Fitness as well. Hello, welcome to the show, Dawn. Hello. Now, you, this is the task. Are you going to take it on? Of course. Of course. Now listen, we're going to talk about the importance of fitness, not from a beauty, because of course you can't improve perfection, not from a beauty point of view, but from a health point of view. Now you teach Pilates, you do Zumba, is that right? And yes. we've also got a little bit of video coming up as well. It's, uh, one of the main problems is people sitting at the computers all the time. Now, just to talk about fitness and all that, I mean, it's, it's for everybody really. You must think ahead about, um, well, I just want to tell you about me. Now they're using me as a kind of a guinea pig in this case because um, I've been fat all my life. Now, lots of us, some of us smoke, some of us eat, some of us drink, some of us do all three. I don't do two of those. I kind of probably eat the wrong things. But I've always been fat and fit up to a degree. But in the last two years, that has caught up with me. I now have diabetes too. I've got osteoarthritis and I've got other various disability problems. And a lot of that is caused by being overweight. So this is more about trying to get everybody to use me as an example. Okay. And just to show you the importance of actually losing weight keeping fit because even if you've got a you know a good slim you still need to keep fit don't you absolutely you do yeah so so let's start at the beginning who are you who are who are you i'm dawn yes. <laughs> tell me a bit about why are you qualified to teach and give us all advice what's your okay. qualification well i've been a fitness instructor for seven years yes i am a an exercise to music instructor yeah. registered at level two mm -hmm. and I'm also a, a level three Pilates instructor. Uh, I teach kickboxing as well so mm -hmm. quite a lot of experience and properly qualified which is so important to make sure that you have somebody who knows what they're doing and knows about your body. Yes. Now people kind of like me sometimes come into an exercise class it's embarrassing I mean, I've never actually been to one because I'm kind of a little bit embarrassed because okay. you're going to get there and you think, oh, it's going to be full of ladies, I'm fat and all that kind of thing. And you, What would you say to somebody like me? I would say, come along. We're all real people. We're all shapes and sizes. We're all ages. And we'll look after you because we make sure that the class is suitable for absolutely everybody. Adapt it to suit the people who are in my class and... Yeah, don't feel threatened, just come along. Yeah, but then I could say to you, and lots of people would find excuses for not doing it. I said, oh, but I've got a bad back, I've got a bad knee, I've got bad shoulders, I can't do it yet, I've got to get better before I do it. What would you say to them? No, oh. I would say come along because we can help you. Movement is good for your body. I can adapt what we're doing to suit. If you have a sore knee, then there's things that you shouldn't do. So we'll make sure that you avoid them. So your classes, and we'll go through those in a bit, they're not just ensemble classes. Do you treat everybody as an individual so they're not kind of all doing the same exercises? Can yes. you just talk me through that yeah. a little bit? Particularly oh, yes. in Pilates, um, I have a small class, mm -hmm. uh, no more than 12 at a time, and make sure that I know about every individual client and any conditions, any health problems, any injuries, and make sure that every exercise that they do is suitable for their bodies. Mm -hmm. So you could have 12 people in the class doing a few different things at the same time, doing it in a different way, best for them. So even though you have a, and your class sizes are 12? For Pilates, yes. And that's no a more. good size. And they all get personal treatments and you find out all about their ailments beforehand so yes. you can really personalise it. That's right. Now keeping fit is really really important because going forward it can have so many different effects on your body as I know. So keeping fit, what does that mean to you? I mean it's literally for everybody throughout your life. Uh, one of the main problems I find is that my problem is that I sit at the computer a lot and sometimes I can be that sat there for hours and sometimes I can sit there and I have gone as long as eight hours and realise I've not moved from this computer for the last eight hours and I try to stand up and it's oh mm. a lot of the problems it's not just about everyday walking and running a lot of people are statutory nowadays aren't they they don't move so right. if somebody's in a job where they're doing computer work or sat down a lot what's your advice for for them to kind of keep fit but you know don't sit down, you have to move. What's your kind of rules there? I would make sure that you move 
at least once an hour if you can. Get up and have a little walk about yeah. because you're going to get really, really stiff and sore sitting for that long. Make sure that you have good posture as well. The way that you're seated, don't slouch in your chair. Make sure mm -hmm. you're sitting up really straight and use your tummy muscles. Tummy muscles? Yeah, they're in there. Are they in there? They're in there. Let's have a little poke, see if you can find them. <laughs> are they there? They're there. They're there. I'll take your word for it. Now, listen, Dawn did a, a little video earlier on for us. We're going to show you that. And it's just a few little exercises. If you're sat at your computer, just a few things that you can do to help ease the pain. Okay, so many people end up at the end of the day sitting in a desk chair. Very uncomfortable shoulders, sore back. So there are a few things that you can do whilst at work to help with that. First of all, make sure you're sitting properly in the chair. So sitting well back, your feet in line with your hips, making sure that you're lengthening up through your spine, trying not to slouch, and keeping your shoulders down and back and your chest lifted, lifting up your rib cage. So the first exercise that we're going to do nice and easy, you're just going to shrug your shoulders up and let them melt back down just lifting and melting one more time. Good. Then just a nice shoulder roll, nice and slowly. Do you have any crunching going on? And then we'll try the other side. So just loosening up a little bit. Okay, so the first one we're going to do, you may experience a burning sensation across the top of your shoulders here if you're sitting forward a lot of the time. So we're just going to correct that, going to open your chest and strengthen the muscles here to hold you in that position. Elbows in by your sides, your hands in line with your elbows here, keeping your elbows in. We're just taking your arms out to the side and back in again. So just drawing in gently with your tummy, drawing your navel in towards your spine to give your back some support. Taking your arms out, keeping your elbows in and back in again. So make sure you keep breathing, breathing out and in. So you should feel that working around the back of your shoulders, your shoulder blade area and you may experience some tightness in here. Let's see your muscles lengthening, stretching. Lovely. Okay, so the next one we're going to do a nice slow shoulder roll and this will feel great once we're finished. So hand on your shoulder, keeping your ribs lifted, keep lengthening up through your spine. Just going to slowly lift your elbow to here, relax your shoulder down, flatten your hand, and then slowly just circling around, keeping your ribs in position, trying not to twist. And again, so you can do anything up to five of these on each side. We're just going to do three. So the last one, lifting up, melt your shoulder down and circle around. So when you finish, you'll notice this shoulder feels much different to this one. So make sure you balance up and do the other side as well. So melt your shoulder down, lifting and rolling. Keep drawing in with your abdominals, lengthening up through your spine. Just two more to go, nice and slowly. Try not to let your ribs twist around to the side. shoulder melting down and relaxing. So your shoulders should feel great. Hopefully you've alleviated any burning sensation in here and remember to keep sitting in a good position to avoid back pain. Thank you. Hi, well it's Guy Fox Week and we've got to be very careful at this time of year. We've got to be very careful of, of all the safety around the, the Guy Fox events, both adults and children. We are lucky today to have Neil Kerr from Tayside Fire and Rescue with us. Neil's actually the, the station manager here in Perth. Neil, welcome to Perth Online TV. Hello Gavin, thank you for asking me along. No problem. Um, Neil, Operation Trico, heard quite a lot about that recently. What, can you give us some background to the, the project, who's involved and what some of the objectives are? Yes, it's Tayside Fire and Rescue, Tayside Police, the Community Safety Environment and Community Wardens working together as a partnership proactively to prevent people injuring themselves at this time of year. What we're trying to do is prevent illegal bonfires and misuse of fireworks. Right. You know, over, over the years there's there's been lots of campaigns, there's lots of annual campaigns around safety and fireworks and bonfires. Surely the public are, are quite well versed on what's, what, 
what, what the do's and don'ts are to some extent. Yes, the public are well aware of the dangers of, of uh, fireworks and bonfires. However, there are a small minority who really don't follow the rules. And uh, what happens is not just hundreds of people every year, but thousands of people are injured through misuse of fireworks and bonfires every year. I mean, because it's amazing. I, I was reading some statistics that things like even uh, a little kid's sparkler that you think must be one of the most safe, safe, safe things under the sun for them to be playing with in Guy Fawkes is something like 15 times the boiling point of water and a rocket can go over 115 miles an hour. That's correct, yes. People don't understand just how dangerous sparklers are. People using sparklers should really wear gloves, the reason being that the sparks obviously will uh, land on their skin at some point. And when they are finished, they are still very hot and they can do very severe damage. If you're going to dispose of them, then don't just throw them away where children can pick them up, but put them someplace like a, a bin with uh, sand in it so that no one's going to be harmed by them. Neil, you've got a great um, website, www.taysidefire.gov.uk. It's got lots of information generally about um, safety and specifically around bonfires and fireworks. Can you just kind of quickly maybe... Um, go through some of the, the key do's and don'ts for, yeah, for the public. Yeah, certainly. The, the website actually, if you go under Home Fire Safety, mm -hmm. will give you a list of different things linked to house and, uh, and the safety due to fires. And in that you've got firework displays. And it gives you the do's and don'ts of using fireworks and having bonfires. Obviously if you're going to have fireworks, a lot of people do have firework displays in their gardens, make sure that you prepare properly, which means you need to read the instructions. It takes a wee bit extra time, but if you prepare, then it won't mean that somebody won't get injured and it, it does ensure your safety. Children should be kept well back from fireworks at all times and when you're lighting them, light them at arm's length. If a firework doesn't go off, don't go back to it. Uh, it would be handy to have a bucket of water in the garden at the same time. This way you could douse the, the, the firework if it hasn't gone off properly. And again, when they've been used, you should dispose of them properly by putting them in a, a steel bucket or sand pit or something like that. And it's not just the fireworks, but you know a, a, the bonfire itself. That's right. You've got yeah. to take do sensible things. It's although it may be, um, it may be the, the type of idea that you want to throw your rubbish and your furniture and your aerosol cans and things, and that's, that's just right. a crazy thing to do, isn't it? It is indeed. And, and if you're going to have a bonfire, then use clean fuel. That would be just just timber, maybe some mm -hmm. paper to start it off with. A lot of people will use fluids, you know, like barbecue fluids, to start the fire off. The problem with that, that the fluids give off vapours. Now, these vapours can explode, and that's what causes the injury. If you're putting aerosols and other things like cylinders on, then obviously they're going to be under, under pressure, and when they do get hot, they may explode and can cause severe damage. Well, Neil, thanks for coming along today. And um, I know you're getting ready for the, for the winter ahead, and that's there's right. the se severe weather preparation, and I hope you're, you're going to pop back in again um, in an episode soon to, to give us some, some views on that as yeah, well. Yeah, I, I would really like to do that. Uh, just on a finishing note though, we know Halloween and bonfire are fun times. We want everyone to enjoy themselves, we want them to be safe and act responsibly. We would advise people to go to organised events where they won't get injured and do think about other people when you're using fireworks. Neil, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, enjoy, enjoy Guy Fox night, but um, play safely as well and remember to have a look at www.tsidefire.gov.uk. Hello, I'm Alan Gear, and welcome to Perthshire's online What's On. Uh, and now I want to start off by reminding you of Callum's Road. Now that's on Wednesday the 2nd of November for one night only at the Perth Theatre. Now the performance starts at 7.45pm and if you want to see a video clip of that just refer to last week's show. Now also on the 2nd of November at the Perth Concert Hall is the Scottish Chamber Orchestra. The performance begins at 7.30pm. Now the performance features the master concert pianist Robert Levin. Robert Levin is an international star performer and a high-flying academic. Few people know more about the age of Mozart, Beethoven and Schubert, but don't expect a boring, dusty lecture. Oh no, Levin's researches have led him to conclude that Beethoven's performances were more like jazz than today's classical performance. Mm, posh. <laughs> Anyway, we've also got a great comic as well coming, Jim Owen. Now, he's here on Thursday the 3rd of November at the Perth Theatre at 7.30pm. He is performing his production, Lovely. That's the name of the show. Not that he's lovely. He probably is. Anyway, he is 
a stunning world-class stand-up comedian and was the star of Michael McIntyre's Comedy Roadshow, Jason Manford's Comedy Rocks and the Best of Edinburgh Comedy Festival. So there's no gimmicks, just pure and simple great comedy and it's suitable for over 16s and over. I think we all know what that means, don't we? Anyway, we've also got, if I can say it, the Mug Yenko Taiko Drummers. And uh, uh, they're fantastic, I believe. They're, I mean, it's going to be, if you want to really want a great night with heart pounding music, I'd go to this. And it starts on Thursday, the 3rd of November at the Perth Concert Hall. Now, the performance begins at 8 pm. Thundering rhythms of huge taiko drums interweaved with layers of percussive soundscapes and delicate bamboo flute. This is a spellbounding display of precise choreography and sheer athleticism. They have developed a gritty, passionate style that is uniquely their own. They retain the traditional spirit of Tycho, yet creating a contemporary sound of a modern stage show that has captivated audiences. Just when you think it could not get any more powerful, it doubles in intensity. <laughs> this show is one not to be missed. Now, uh, do you like Shylock? Eh? Not to be confused with The Merchant of Venice. No, this is a play all about the character Shylock, and it's on Friday the 4th of November at the Perth Theatre. Now, the performance begins at 7.45. It's written and directed by Gareth Armstrong and performed by Guy Masterson. Is he a villain or a victim? Or is Shylock someone even more intriguing? Guy Masterson's Shylock reveals the tragic, tempestuous and often unbelievable life of fiction's most famous Jew. This dazzling, moving and yet extremely comedic play is a fascinating exploration of Shylock. Shakespeare and Judaism through the ages that bring Shakespearean and to life, history to the forefront and magic to the stage. Now I want to tell you about the Persia Amber, the Dougie McLean Festival. It's the last two days of it, starting on the 4th of November. It's Friday night and it's at the Perth Concert Hall. Now the performance begins at 8pm. This is a very special performance, bringing together Scotland's master of songwriting and composition with a stunning strings ensemble. Celtic instrumentalists and choirs, including the choirs of the Lothian Borders and Police Choir. And then on the last night, Saturday the 5th of November at the Perth Concert Hall, Dougie McLean and friends perform. Performance begins at 8pm. This is the final evening of a 10-day festival. It always has a special atmosphere with lots of surprises. It brings together some of Dougie's musical friends, old and new, in an eclectic and stunningly talented lineup. Now, those of you who love golf, we're bringing you Peter Alice as well. He's here on Monday the 7th of November at the Perth Concert Hall. Now, it starts at 7.30pm. The further golfing adventures of Peter Alice, following on from his sellout first visit last year. Now the voice of golf returns for the back nine over a hugely entertaining round with Alice. A must for all you golfing fans. The evening with Peter is packed with stories he couldn't fit in on his first time around. Forthright opinions and lots of laughs developed in his imitable, relaxed, anecdotal style. And some of you will say he's the best commentator ever. But what I'm going to do now is just leave you a little bit of a roundup of everything that I've chatted about. But also remember, have a fantastic bonfires night. And if you can, go to a well-organised event. And that way, you'll hopefully keep safe. So, till the next time, happy bonfire night. The cowboys, the wrestlers, the tumblers, the clowns, the roustabouts that move the show at dawn. The music, the spotlights, the people, the towns, your baggage with the labels pasted on. The sawdust and the horses and the smell. The towel you've taken from the last hotel. There's no business like show business like no business I know. Everything about it is appealing. Everything the traffic will allow. No work 
Could you have that happy feeling when you are stealing that extra bow? There's no people like show people. They smile when they are low. Yesterday they told you you would not go far. That night you opened and there you are. Next day on your dressing room they found a star. Let's go on with our show. Hi and welcome to our new regular feature, The Community Hub, where I'm joined by Stephen Crofts from the Perthshire Hub. Stephen, welcome. Thank you very much. Stephen, first of all, it's been about six months since you actually launched um, the Perthshire Hub. How, I'm sure you've had your challenges over that period, but um, how's things going? Uh, yeah, there has been challenges, but it's going really well, we're pleased to say. Uh, we've just increased uh, our pages from 16 to 20 for the first time. Great. And the uh, print run, uh, up to 11,000. Uh, so even more places uh, across Perthshire are um, getting the, the good news stories. Fantastic. And we've just opened our, our Perth office up at King James. So all good moves in the, the positive direction. That's fantastic. Well, congratulations to Thank you and you. the team. So a regular feature, we are, we are actually going to be flipping through the, um, the latest edition and you and I are just going to pick some um, stories that are, we think, are community-worthy stories to, to chat through. Right. So shall we start off on... <coughs> the front page yeah. and geocachers and I think it's cachers not catchers geo so. geocachers find hidden treasure on Canoe Hill now I don't know much about this um, activity or sport at all but as I understand it, geocaching marries the old fashioned treasure hunt with modern technology and it's catching on like wildfire in Perthshire yeah, well, this particular event um, attracted 1,500 people or uh, geocachers taking part Fantastic. so that was quite good, um, good. The, the biggest Bonus, I'd say, is to, is to the Persia economy. Three hundred thousand pounds in additional revenue coming into to Persia as a result of just that one event. So fantastic! Fantastic. That's what it's all about, exactly. And to find out more about geocaching in Persia, log on to www.persiabigtreecountry.co.uk. So we flip across onto the next page. Well, the one that catches my eye on the on the top of page three is something called PersiaOnline.tv. Yeah, I've heard it's rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move on yeah. quickly then, shall we? <laughs> move on quickly. Um, the next one is the Leon Sindon Award winners were announced. It's the 17th annual Leon Sindon Awards um, at Pitlochry Festival Theatre. Yeah, that was um, after the um, performance of the My Fair Lady. Um, the Best Actor and Actress in a Supporting Role Awards were made by veteran actor Leon Sindon. Uh, Fantastic. And the and the um the best sporting actress was won by Kate Quinnell, I think that's how it's pronounced, for her portrayal of Ida and see how they run. And Fred Broom picked up the the award for best supporting actor for his performance as the Reverend of Arthur Humphrey. So um fantastic. Yeah, well, Congratulations like to a, them. Um, post trial Oscars. Just a bit, just a bit, <laughs> isn't it? Um if we move on. Well, sorry, that, yes, that was the um, Perth and Kinross Council area gains outstanding results for child protection as a headline. Um, that was the child protection services in Perth and Kinross who achieved an outstanding in the, the latest um, inspectorate. Um, just in case anyone's wondering about that, it also makes them the best in Scotland, so well done to them and, and you know, a testament to the efforts they're making to, to protect children in Perth. Right? Congratulations to the PKC um, child protection team. Well done. The one that catches my eye on page nine is the new local, local initiative to clamp down on underage sales, and it's a new pilot initiative to help retailers in Perth and Conros who sell age-restricted products. It's been launched by the Council. The Responsible Retailer Partnership, the RRP, has been introduced by the Council's Trading Standards Service. So that's an interesting initiative as well. It is. Um, what they did is, is send out um, a, a variety of you know, 14, 15 euros to try and buy underage products um, and just to see what kind of systems were in place rather than catch... So the underage mystery out. shopper, is it? Well. Yeah, yeah, but really just to see what systems people had in place and, and to try and rectify that if, if anyone was a bit unsure about That's what great. they should be doing. And um, any retailer who wishes to express an interest um, should contact Angie Cruikshanks at PKC. That's acruikshanks at pkc.gov.uk. And a room with a view in the centre pages. <laughs> now, I believe you're experienced in this one. I am. Yeah, you may have noticed, uh, this is this is in the story anyway, um, a flurry of UFOs uh, across the, the skies of Perth. Well, I didn't see any of them. No, there's, no. there's loads and loads and loads. But on one occasion anyway, it was, it was me, I was flying above Perth Shire in one of these gyrocopters, which is a cross between like, a very small aeroplane and a helicopter, I suppose, and a yeah. motorbike. It's, it, a funny, it's a funny looking wee thing, isn't it? It's, it like, is, a, yeah. it's like a wee plane with the, with the end cut off. And no wings. And no wings. Yes, obviously. Ah, no wings, actually. <laughs> it's no a bit wings. like a flying motorbike with a propeller. Um, but quite an experience, uh, very good. I would highly recommend anyone 
going and doing it if, if they fancy that kind of thing. Um, you do get the benefits of unrestricted views um, from it across purchase. So there's no sides on it. I can see below you, at the side, in front. Uh, and, and many thanks to, to Kevin who took me up there and, and kept me safe and brought me back down to earth very gently. So, very good. <laughs> but a scary experience. So good um, it was a bit of both. It was scary to start with, um, but once I'd been up there for five or ten minutes, it, it was you know it was really good, uh, and can't wait to do it again. Great. Well, on that high note, we'll finish <laughs> this week's episode. Yep. And um, thanks for popping in, Stephen. And we'll see you next week. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed the community hub. Yes, I've got a fabulous download for you here. Now you get fireworks, not only just fireworks, you could use it for celebration on New Year's Eve or anywhere you want kind of uh, fireworks and explosions and all sorts of things. Anyway, all you've got to do is download the image, cut out all the compartments, compartments, components, and uh, then you can make up a nice fireworks card and use it any way that you want. Right, what I've got here, I've got a nice piece of purple card. It's an ordinary A4 piece of card. You can choose any colour that you want. And all you're going to do is fold that over, put that into position like that, hold it in position so it's not going to slip, and then just press that down along the edge here. Now I've got the back of a pair of scissors here. You want to get a nice crease all the way along the edge here. So I'm just going to run the back of the scissors down there so you get a nice crease and that opens up like that, like so. You've got that lovely crease in your card. So that's the basis of the card and that's going to sit that way like that. So it's going to be a landscape card. Now, in the download, you've also got this beautiful card here. This lovely one here, as you can see down here, with the exploding fireworks all over it. It's a little bit smaller than the actual card itself. And on the back, I've already prepared it with some double-sided tape. And I'm just going to take the back off there. You could use glue if you wish to, uh, but I've got the double-sided tape. And then all you've got to do is position that gently in the right position on your card. I'm going to stick that down there like that. And then that's going to stick down there like that. And then you've got that directly onto the card like so. You've got a little bit of the purple showing all the way around. So there's your exploding fireworks. Next, we've got the next image that's on the sheet here. Uh, and there you can see you've got the um, kind of a kind of a contemporary look there of the exploding uh, rockets and rip wraps and all sorts of different uh, fireworks going off there. Now I'm going to put this on a slight, I've put double sided pads on the back there but you could stick it flat. This is just going to raise it up a little bit. But I'm going to stick this on a slight jaunty angle like that and that's going to stick over the top there. So you can see there, there's your card coming together. You could, if you wanted to, stick this down onto some nice gold card or something like that then leave a quarter of an inch all the way around it, give it a little bit more sparkle. Next we've got the decoupage sections. Now there's the first section there and it's just going to raise the rockets and give it a little bit more three dimension. And they've got some foam pads on the back of there and that's just going to fit over the top like that. And you can see the first layer and you're getting that 3D look. Next I've got the next one here and it doesn't have the rocket, top of the rocket on here and that's going to go directly over the top of that again. And you can see there how you're getting that lovely 3D look there. So it's really making that rocket come out of the card. Then we've also got some next pieces here. We've got a couple more rockets. Now, you can decide where you want to put these. I mean, you could slide those underneath there and have them coming out of the top, or you could have them like that. I think I'm going to stick them like this. So it's just a bit of double-sided tape on the back there. And you've got an extra rocket. And I think we'll have one shooting off this way here, like so. And there is your card all finished. And I think that looks fantastic. So all you've got to do is download the main image, print it out anytime you want. And anytime you want a fantastic firework card, well then, print it out and make it. I lived in South Africa for seven years and I well remember a weekend after after being away with some a group of friends. We returned back to Cape Town but we stopped off at a local bungee jump on the way. Now it was the first time I'd ever seen anything like that. It was very daunting and I must confess I didn't do the jump, um, which I very much regret actually to this day. Today we've got John Mason Strang, who's one of the founders and one of the team from Highland Fling Bungee, which was launched this year, is based at Gary Bridge up in Killy Cranky. John, welcome to the show. Welcome to Press Online TV. Good morning, Gavin. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. 
John, great, great unique concept. Um, very interesting from a business perspective. Wh why did you decide it was going to work in Perthshire, here in Perthshire? Uh, well, first of all, I'll give a little plug to one of my other businesses, which is Nay Limits. And we, we run uh, several adventure sports businesses, mm -hmm. but um, through running these businesses and the inquiries that we get for them, um, it became very obvious that there was this massive gap in the adventure sport industry of bungee jumping. You mm -hmm. can literally bungee jump almost anywhere in the world, apart from Scotland, right. or even wholly in the UK, apart from being on a crane. So we decided to fill that gap, and that's exactly what we've done. Great. And you started in May? We did indeed, yep. Been quite a long process in the planning, from what I understand as well. It has indeed, yeah. A very long, long process, but we're glad to say we're there now. In fact, we've been there four years at this process. So. And you've, you mean, you've had the summer months, you've probably benefited from the, the, the Scottish tourism market, but how have things gone? What's the response been like? Because it, it, it is such a daring, daring adventure. It is indeed. Uh, the response has been really overwhelming, actually. We forecasted approximately 4,000 jumpers between the first 12 and 18 months with what, what we thought we could realistically achieve. In the first five months of being open, we were hitting 3,500 jumpers. That's fantastic. So to, to say that we were overwhelmed is probably a little underwhelming. So well, over, well over the business plan. <laughs> it certainly is, is, yes. Great. Yes, it is. Well, we, you know we put a little VT together, um, just showing some of the jumpers yeah. and, and how things are going, and it'll give everybody a feel. So mm -hmm. let's, let's, let's move across to that. Great. Come have a look. looks fantastic doesn't it it's really pretty exciting and it's got me quite motivated to do it and give it give it a try actually i must be honest john it it does it looks fantastic and these people look like they're really enjoying themselves as well they are um needs to say it, it does create quite a lot of nervous tension as you get there but with the fantastic team that we've got on that jump deck they can certainly produce the the right feeling to dispatch you off that jump and it's amazing yeah it really is amazing from from a business perspective, irrelevant of any industry sector that you're in, John, um, a, a lot of the challenge is actually getting the right people at the right time, the right place, um, recruitment-wise, skills-wise, experience-wise. experience, experience wise. Um, and, and equally with the, the, the industry sector that, that you're in and the location that you're in, that, that must have been a bit of a challenge. How, how did you get around all that? It is a challenge, there's no doubt, because of the unique sort of nature of the, the, the sport or the experience, it does raise problems with trying to find suitable staff, uh, people who are uh, appropriately qualified and skilled and, and making people feel comfortable in doing something like that. Um, but we are lucky enough that, you know, obviously worldwide there are various other bungee jumps, namely AJ Hackett, um, who have probably the biggest bungee jump in the world. We've got the UK Bungee Club who operate in the UK to amazing standards and we can tap into that. And we were fortunate to uh, find a, a gentleman called Gavin Gibson, who's our jump master. Um, he was one of the leading jump masters for AJ Hackett and has jumped uh, or basically dispatched jumpers across the world on various sites for AJ Hackett and so he's done something like 300,000 jumpers and so is well qualified to that and he helps us also along with the UK Bungee Club to train the rest of the team that deliver the jump to a really high standard. Fantastic, so I remember it from South Africa mm -hmm. um, I seem to think that I've got it in my head that bungee jumping originated in Australia or New Zealand or something, is that is that right? I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure in the, in the history at all, <laughs> sure, yeah. to be honest. Surprisingly, uh, a lot of people think that. 
Um, firstly, the, the bungee jumping itself actually originated in the UK, but not commercially. So the right, very okay. first bungee jumps were uh, done by the Cambridge Dangerous Sports Club, um, or sorry, the Oxford Dangerous Sports Club um, from a bridge down in Wales. Um, but it wasn't commercial. However, the first commercial jumps were indeed done on the other side of the hemisphere, and that was in New Zealand. It was done from the Kawara Bridge over the Shotsover River, just outside Queenstown. Fantastic. Yeah. And, we're, and we're on the map now. We're now on the, the map. map. There we are indeed, yeah. So um, we're, we're fortunate in Perthshire to some extent, John. We've got a, we've got a very ver big variety of businesses. We've got, I mean, we've got corporates, head office in, in, in Perthshire that... Um, that that trade internationally. We've got strong medium-sized businesses that um, that have a very good presence both locally and probably nationally in Scotland as well. But there's always a challenge in setting up and starting up a new a new small business. I mean, what do you think some of the the, the key things are in um, in starting up a business from scratch as you've as you've done with with the Highland Fling Bungee, for example? For the, for the entrepreneur or the person looking at starting up a business, even whether it's in this industry or any, first of all, you've got to have the vision. You've got to have the passion and the vision to um, really want to drive that, the thing that's in your head forward. And there has to be a gap. There has to be a very obvious need for, for the actual product that you're looking to put to market. And so you have to identify the product. You need to be passionate about what it is and you need to understand uh, how it's going to look as the end product, so you have a goal to to drive towards. Mm -hmm. And you know there was there was quite a bit of um, planning, obviously, in this whole concept and Indeed. permissions, and I'm sure lots yeah. of support needed from a variety mm -hmm. of people because it was quite so unusual. I think these days a, a lot of it is having the tenacity as well as the small business owner because you've kind of got yeah, to, to keep going to mm -hmm. some extent, For sure, even, yeah. even when there gets a bit right, uh, the ride gets a bit rough sometimes. Um, it has been a four-year journey for you, from I think from when you started it off mm -hmm. to, to where you are at this point, Sam. Um, how do you keep things fresh? I mean, I'm, I hate to say this because it's a, it's a drop exercise, but how do you, with the bungee, but how do you raise the bar and, 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 and keep the whole idea and the concept fresh for, for people to come, come back again, I suppose, as well? You're absolutely right, Gavin. Um, the, in any business, it's important to keep things fresh. Um, what we do is... In the beginning, when you first come up to do a bungee jump from our deck, we can only allow you to do a traditional forwards-facing bungee jump. So you'll only allow me to do... Absolutely, to do yeah. Any, any first jumper will only be allowed to do that traditional jump because it allows the, the team on the deck to make sure everything's precise, you're happy, you're comfortable, and you're jumping correctly, and they can see you're jumping confidently. However, as you jump again and again and again, then they can start to experiment with that, keep it fresh, allow you to jump backwards, they can allow you to do things like running men, you can drum, jump up in sort of crazy costumes, etc., when they're comfortable. But more importantly for us, it's changing the environment you're jumping in and that's where we've come to uh, introducing night bungee which uh, we are one of the first in europe to do this um and it's just adding new elements to it or should i say taking them away fantastic and you've got quite a big strong social media following as well mm -hmm. we do we do indeed um facebook and twitter uh we have literally over a thousand followers on each um because of the nature of what we do is very much a lifestyle mm. industry and it's a life's lifestyle business so pe people are naturally drawn to that to challenge themselves in their own spare time and it really does create it really does create a community buzz there is a real feeling of family people who've experienced the same things as you so yeah we, we are very fortunate in that respect and it's all about social media is all about talking talking and listening as well it is and you've got to be very customer service orientated so that must be an interesting dynamic within within the um within your your business as well because some people must come there come there and that that heart must be pounding to some extent and your staff must be <laughs> come to <be laughs> such a calm exterior i suppose that's right um you're, you're absolutely spot on when you say listening to the customer because that is the key to providing exactly what they want um, once people come up to jump or doing any of the adventure sports we provide, they are there's a lot of nervous tension and nervous energy, and 80% of the customers who arrive there do loads of talking because of that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always one extreme or the other. Either you're talking to comfort them, or they're talking to, to cope or soak yeah. up that nervous energy. Yeah. But during that time that they're doing all the talking, especially when after they've completed the jump, that's when you hear all the stuff that they really loved and you can focus on and the th things that they would like to try in the future because they're just spilling it all out. And what's this double dare? 
The Double Dare is actually uh, another product where we are uh, combining and pack packaging up existing activities, adventure activities. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are not aware of just what you can achieve and what you can do and experience in uh, Highland Persia and Persia as a whole. So what we do is, because bungee's such a draw, we've introduced, packaged things up like white water rafting and bungee, and that's created Double Dare, and our intention is to continue along that packaging theme. Fantastic. So what do you think, I mean obviously it's been very busy for you, you've gone over the business plan with regards to the, uh, the jumpers, yep. that must be driving quite a lot of tourism and an, an indirect business to, to Perthshire and to Highland Perthshire. What do you actually feel from your perspective it's done for Perthshire and for Scotland? As far as I can, I, I'm aware and certainly the feeling that we get as a team that uh, we, we study that industry quite quite closely and without a doubt um, it's definitely putting Persia and, and if not Scotland on the map and putting us back up where we belong as far as adventure sports internationally. If you look at the, the rest of the world and every country that looks to provide adventure experiences they're all up there with the be some of the best canyoning in the world, you know, really unique experiences, bungee, etc, etc. And bungee here is now, and having a permanent site that we can visit, or anyone can visit, actually puts us back up there with all the great providers. Not a lot of people are aware of this. Whilst perhaps we may struggle to compete with some of the extremities of the adventure sports, like, um, you know, Zambezi and, and the whitewater rafting there, mm -hmm. what we can do is, we can, you can actually... Um, experience more adventure sports per mile condensed in a per mile in Highland Persia than you can anywhere How's else. Really? You can indeed, yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Great. John, for you and the team, congratulations. Well Thank done. It's been, it's been great success for you and I hope it continues to be so and I'm sure it will be over the over the next few months. Great. And we Thanks hope to see you again Cameron. soon. Thank you. So all sounds really exciting. I'm now, I suppose I'm now a convert and I should make, make my way up to, um, to Killy Cranky and, and do the jump at some point in time. So if you're, if you're local to Perthshire or you're visiting Perthshire and you want something really exciting to do, or perhaps it's um, a, a present for the, someone special in your life and you want them to experience something very adventurous, then I suppose all roads lead to Gary Bridge at Killy Can Cranky and a wee drop of Highland Flame Bungee. Well, thanks very much to our guests again for appearing on today's show. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. We certainly have. Um, if you're a business and you'd like to promote yourself, or perhaps you've got a product that you'd like to demonstrate on the show or some news that you'd like to share, do get in contact with us. The contact details are all on our website. And we'll see you next week. But in between times, I'm going to be very busy making my Guy Fox card, um, which I'll be sending out. Well, my Guy Fox cards, which I'll be sending out this week. To uh, certain friends and associates. One for me, is that two cards in two weeks? Two Harry? cards in two weeks, Lindsay. So remember, you can get the free download from the website. Just click on the link and take it from there. And remember, it is Guy Fawkes Week. Um, please do, do, do be safe when, when you're out there. But um, be even safer. Watch our firework display. <laughs>